for today, we're going to go and we're going to take a look at some of the background um, information and some of the framework for the book that was published last year on the history of the human growth hormone industry. So here's my research question. It's not overly uh, that complex or sophisticated, but it was a question that actually sent me on quite a journey um, as far as this book is concerned. And the question is, why is growth hormone used to treat short stature? Um, it's an interesting question for me, in part because it draws in a lot of um, uh, topics about why is short stature seen as a problem? Um, why do we see short stature as a problem in children? Children are short. Um, so what's going on there? And then also this idea that a hormone can be called its function, so the growth hormone, and the discovery of the growth hormone and the isolation of it, and then also the synthesizing of it is actually a really interesting story. So I was drawn to this topic in a very classical sense as far as wanting to know a little bit about the history of this pharmaceutical. But very early on, I became much more curious about the social context of where and how growth hormone ther therapy develops. So like I said, this kind of left me, uh, left me kind of sitting there and thinking about where to go, right? And it led me on a lot of different journeys. One of those paths had to do about uh, public health and children's health and public campaigns um, over here up on the upper right, the health protection for every child, the way in which children were perceived as either normal or average, and also how that idea of normal and average was also one in which optimal played a role in was something that became very um, interesting to me that I sought out more information about. It also led me to the history of pediatrics and taking a look at old pediatric textbooks in part to see when growth hormone therapy becomes one of uh, the treatments that, are recommend that is recommended and also to see how height matters in that context, right? So taking a look at the history of the growth chart. I spent a lot of time looking at growth charts, looking at the data from which they come from. Um, who gets measured? And how do those measurements get represented in a clinical context and also in a medical education context was something that deep, I found deeply interesting and was part of my story. Another part of my story is, uh, is the lower left here. Uh, does anybody know who that might be? Munchkins, that's right. In particular, they're called the Lollipop Guild. Um, and in fact, these three men had a great successful uh, history um, and, and, and uh, previous movies that they had played in before The Wizard of Oz. So it led me down the yellow brick road. Like, right? Anyways, um, so, these, so these three men, their history, their role, um, cultural significance, and also this idea of just short stature as being a problem, was that always the case in a modern context, was something I became increasingly interested in. And it led me to the world of looking at the ways in which small statured men um, performed their stature in public settings, things like uh, expositions. Anybody familiar with the PPIE, the Panama Pacific International Exposition, right? 1915 took place. Uh, in San Francisco, it was supposed to celebrate our rebuild and also the construction of the Panama Canal, and it featured small sta a, a village where in which small statured people, you could go and you could take a look at them, right? So you have expositions like that throughout the country that, um, that put these people on display. I wanted to know why and how that might play a role in how scientists and clinicians understand short stature and if it's something that should be treated. I also took a look at the pharmaceutical industry. This is not a book that is going to necessarily damn uh, Big Pharma. Uh, although often when it gets written up, that's exactly how it's written up. Like, this is going to expose all the inner, inner, inner workings of Big Pharma and how they created short stature as a, a medical problem that needed to be treated. And while the pharmaceutical industries do play an important role, and we can talk more about that role during the interview and also in the Q&A, they actually come pretty late onto the scene and they really kind of map on top of something that already is, pre is pre-existing and has pretty deep roots culturally. And so this image in the lower right is actually from the Genentech website and they encourage those uh, parents in particular, it seemed like it was, it was 
primarily focused on getting parents um, to input data. But what this website had was that it had this page where you could put in the height and um, age of your child, and a square would show up. And you could see where that square would be, and if you hit the rainbow, I don't know, maybe there's a connection there, I'm not sure, but if you hit the rainbow, that meant you were normal, um, but anything below meant that um, short stature could be problematic for you. It might be something that you want to bring up with your clinician. So this is from Genentech. This is the growth chart that, um, that highlighted uh, what was normal and pathological through this kind of rainbow, a very synthetic presentation. We have the munchkins here that really represent some of the cultural uh, uh, representations of short-statured men and how that changes over time, the history of pediatrics, and the way in which growth is charted, and in particular height, and then also public health and how children are, there's this level of surveillance that starts to develop during World War I and how that really kind of creates um, an ideal normal. And we see that through some of the campaign material um, throughout the years because it starts in 1918 but then it continues on. And like I said, this is from 1937 and one of the images that really struck me when I was conducting my research. After several years of research, um, many trips, uh, <laughs> exploring a lot of different avenues, um, as far as all of my inquiries are concerned, I came up with three main findings that on the surface might seem kind of uh, simplistic in some way, but they actually have pretty kind of uh, interesting backgrounds that uh, I think we're going to get more into in the interview in particular. One is that short stature in boys was stigmatized before growth hormone therapy was used to treat it. And so um, I think that's, like I said, this isn't um, necessarily a treatise to defend Genentech, but it's to kind of, uh, what I wanted to do with this book is I really wanted to show the ways in which uh, things develop sometimes parallel with one another and then they find one another. And in this case, it would be the stigmatization of short stature and growth hormone therapy. And so how those two stories end up intertwined and that at first, uh, and that short stature predates growth hormone therapy was of importance to me. And it's something I really tried to highlight in the book. The second main finding is that origins of growth hormone therapy predate, predates before it was effective. And what I mean by that is that um, in many of the secondary uh, literature that I read and also in the scientific studies, they placed the origin of growth hormone therapy as the year, I think in the book there's an actual like month because it's actually quite a debate, of when that therapy became effective. And in most of the literature, I'd say in all probably only mine is different, is, a revi is, is a revising this somewhat. Um, they don't necessarily look at the time before when growth hormone was actually, growth hormone therapy was ineffective, but they didn't really know that for a while. And actually, that time period and the experiences that they have during from 1921 up until 1958 really influence what happens once the therapy becomes effective. So it's an important, like if there's like one thing you walk away with today, if you could walk away with it, that idea, and then also thinking about when history of medicine is written, sometimes we um, write it in a way in which we're not necessarily being super critical and we're kind of taking on the doctrine of medicine and not really looking at what might have come before, kind of problematizing where origins are. My third finding is that <laughs> changing sociological notions about gender and masculinity influenced the development of the medical treatment of children with short stature and the rise of the human growth hormone industry. In part, the reason why I call it an industry has a lot to do with how the pharmaceutical companies actually named, named themselves and gave themselves kind of a place in this larger story. So that's part of the reason for the language there. Um, but what's interesting about this is that there is a lot of scholarship before that happens that really tries to show the problems with height, and in particular with uh, boys. And uh, that takes a while to take hold, and also they're changing notions. So like I was talking about before with the, little, uh, the Lollipop Guild, those men didn't necessarily always look like that in their movies. And in fact, there used to be a time in which they were seen as quite powerful actors in the films and their portrayals. And then that changes. And so looking at the ways in which those changes happen and how they influence medi uh, medical practice is uh, of interest to me. And I really try to map that out in the book. So those are my three main findings. That's a little overview of what interests me in this topic. Um, it wasn't a topic I ever thought I would write about, and then it's a topic I became extremely engaged with and found it really interesting and um, 
and really relevant to today as growth hormone continues to be something that is debated at an ethical level and then also just some of the findings that have come out recently about um, some of the legacy of, of earlier therapeutics, which we can talk a little bit about if you'd like to. The book is a fantastic read, as we all saw in the introduction a few minutes ago. It has something for people interested in not only medicine and the history of medicine, but the history of American culture, the history of gender, um, the history of disability as well. And you take us from the set of Wizard of Oz to the Circus of Barnum and Bailey to the laboratories of Park Davis, and I think that was all just in chapter two. So mm -hmm. it's a really dynamic read and a really fun one, too. Um, as Amy noted, the book offers one major revision, that this idea that the beginning of the human growth hormone industry dates to the middle of the 20th century is a little bit of a mistake. We can actually push the beginning of that industry back to the early 20th century. And not only that, that this, this story, the story of human growth hormone, actually pushes against this vast literature that says that drug companies have created diseases in the 20th century. And you tell a story, like you said, of a kind of socially and culturally stigmatized condition finding intersection in two parallel routes um, with the, the interests of the drug industry. And I think we'll talk about that more as well. Um, I want us to start our conversation at the beginning. Your, your book traces two parallel stories again. One is the stigmatization of short stature. And the other is the rise of the human growth hormone industry. And at some point, those two intersect. But I wonder if we can kind of break this down piece by piece and first talk about how and when short stature first begins to be stigmatized in our culture. Well, this is within a modern context. We could definitely take this story further back. But thinking about um, increasing interest in short stature in boys what was interesting to me is it's, it's a concern that really comes from progressives and pre-progressive era, people that are hoping to get legislation passed to restrict child labor. That becomes an increasing uh, concern as industrialization takes place in both Europe and the United States beginning in the 19th century. And so in order to show that industrialization or working in the factories is harmful for children and they need some type of regulation, some protection from the government, you have um, well-intentioned uh, public health activists and also just uh, people that are you know, wanting the, the best for folks. You have them going out and championing um, the measuring of children. And they do many other things, but that's one thing in particular, a tactic that they use, to show that all the hours in the factory, this harmful work is actually hurting them physically. And so um, the, 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 the kind of template of how to do that is with, uh, starts with uh, Chadwick in, in Britain, and then it gets transported here in, in the US model in the late uh, 19th century as industrialization ramps up for us. And you have a robust anti-child labor movement that's uh, really taking hold in New York in the early, 19, in the early 20th century, and uh, female activists, um, they, they hire a photographer to go out and to travel the country his name is Lewis Hine. His photography is really well known and is used today still to document child labor and its practices in the early part of the 20th century. In most history textbooks, you're going to see a photo from Lewis Hine. But they ask him to go out and take the, these photos to show what's happening to children. It's a very strategic campaign. It's a campaign that focuses primarily on white children. And that, in part, has to do with his supervisor. His supervisor is from the South, and they're concerned that they won't get the same type of um, appreciation or the same type of uh, activism from the evidence that they're showing people if they include diverse populations in the photography. So by and large, he focuses on white children in places like factories. And, and, and many of us have seen photos of it. And if not, if you look, you'll see it's a Lewis Hine caption. But he was very concerned about documenting the experiences of these children, not only with photography, but also writing down some of the stats. And so um, he actually, when he goes into the factories, he doesn't really want to know the, he doesn't want the people who own the factories to know why he's really there. So he often says like, oh, your machines are so big. I really want to take photos of your machines and have the children stand next to him to just show how monstrous they are. So they're like, okay. And so then he's able to show like, see these children are, are, are understatured because they're working so many hours in the factory. They're not getting the light and, and they're not healthy and they're sick and they're coughing. And, and it's this whole small stature kind of, um, uh, the thing he's trying to capture in his photographs. He, gets, he goes to the point, he gets so strategic that he actually wears a vest 
that has three buttons on it. And he measures the length of the, the, the distance between the buttons and the floor. And so when he goes up to the children and he's talking to them and he's trying to ask them their age and what they do, he quickly takes their uh, measurement of their height and he writes it down as another and he writes it and he includes it in the um, archives in, in his captions and in fact he didn't call it photojournalism so this is a school journalism fact he called it the photo story he was so close to like coining a term but he wasn't quite there but um, this became part of his larger collection of photography that's now um, now part of the library of congress and, and so we start to see these progressives really using short stature as a quick visual to say something is wrong here. Children need to be protected. And that really, you know, in a way, it's, it's effective because it does really kind of prove a point for people, but it also puts short stature in a certain light for, um, for those that are looking at children in a certain way, and, and boys in particular, because many of the photographs are of boys because of who's in the factories and in the mines and what have you. So that's, some of the, that's really kind of the really early roots. And then what happens is that you see um, at the same time there's a growing interest in pediatrics, and in part pediatrics is becoming its own profession. So you see an interest in measuring children, finding out what averages are, and then a recommendation to use those averages in the clinical space. And so Henry Bowditch literally plays a pivotal role in this, and he uh, takes on a huge growth survey in, uh, in Boston, and then he also, and this huge survey provides all these averages and all these tables, and there's these questions that are answered through the data that he provides, and he encourages other growth surveys that are also quite large in other, in other major cities throughout the United States, and at the same time that this is taking place, he goes and he presents at the AMA, and to the first pediatric like meeting that they have there, because like I said, it's just growing as a subfield, and he encourages them to use averages. So this is all kind of happening at the same time. And um, so there's this kind of cultural understanding that something's wrong with short stature. It, it, it's this quick visual that um, something else is at play that's kind of uh, halting the growth. And then you also have this development of data and the use of data in a clinical setting. So it's a perfect storm of sorts. Yeah, and it's interesting that the visual documentation is so key here because certainly there were probably other keys to the, the children's mistreatment or conditions in these factories and weight might have been one. But visually it was easy to kind of show their scale relative to the machinery and also that he had this clever way of measuring their height. It, it becomes a, a very easy kind of currency and, and mm -hmm. data. So we have this, this one story happening, and then in parallel on the other side, we have this, this hormone industry, and part of that is the, the human growth hormone industry. Is that starting at the exact same time? Is it starting a little bit later? And what does so that the, look so like? The, so the discovery of growth hormone is 1921, and it's, a, it's UC, University of California. So <coughs> you have Heaven, uh, Evans, and then later on Lee, he'll take on another researcher in his laboratory. Um, become very curious and want to not only discover this hormone but also identify it. And so Evans identifies it in 1921, writes a paper, and what's interesting about it is that, you know, they say that there's something that's going on here that's from the anterior pituitary gland and that it is promoting growth and so it's a growth hormone. Now there are many different hormones that promote growth in many different ways and what's interesting is that it's given the label growth hormone. It's an interesting name for a hormone. And then at the same time, um, you have, uh, it, it, they can't necessarily isolate it. So you have this like raging debate that takes place from 1921 to 1944. It's not until 1944, again, here, um, that it's isolated. And it's isolated by the same laboratory, and it's Cho Lee, who's, who is a scientist that is able to actually identify so to discover it saying something is happening here, we believe that this is a single growth hormone. Huge debate is just running rampant. And I think it has a lot to do also with some of the biases in the field. Um, this is a West Coast kind of um, observation, publication. Um, scientists in the East Coast are very suspicious. They think there's more than one hormone. They're just, they're not quite sure that enough has been proven. In the 1930s, um, they can't isolate this hormone, they're having such a hard time with it, that the way that they're trying to prove its existence is through its function of growth. Even though in that first article, they talk not only about how it has an influence on growth, but also has an influence on the, on the um, female rats cycle, but they kind of drop that and they focus much more on growth. And so they get these two dogs, these two Dotsons into the lab, and one they feed growth hormone, the other one they don't, and one you can see the effects, and the other one that, you know, there's no effect, and so they say, see, there's a growth hormone. 
But the pushback is that you still haven't isolated it. Like we, you know, something is happening that's obvious, but we just aren't really, really sure. In the 1930s, also there's a there's an increase in use of this growth hormone, and this growth hormone is um, so growth hormone is species specific. So it's not going to work unless you're using the right kind, right? And so in the lab, there's much more successes with growth hormone than there are in clinical settings. But sometimes the what they see in clinical settings, they think are successes, but they're not really. In part because they're giving mm, adolescent children growth hormone. So what happens? They have a growth spurt, and then they go, it must have been what we gave them, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and by this time, companies like Park Davis are interested, they're funding research, um, academic scientists are, 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 are interested in kind of finding this hormone. So there's a good amount of activity that's taking place, again, at UCSF um, by this time in the 1930s, wanting to find it, but they can only find what's happening. And then in 1944, uh, it is isolated. And then, but it, and so, from there, there's this move of, okay, now that we've isolated it, now we can finally see how it works in a clinical setting. Well, what happens? It doesn't work, right? Because all the other stuff that was actually making that drug um, successful is now gone. So if there was other type of like pieces of it, and some of the, <laughs> some of the preparations were so murky, like scientists uh, or clinicians <coughs> would say, what am I supposed to do with this? This seems like it would be harmful if I gave to, gave to mm -hmm. a patient. And they're like, well, you know, that we see that it's more effective that way. But anyway, so once they isolate it, they find out it's really not working on people. And from there, you see this next wave of research that takes place where they finally figure out they need human growth hormone in order to be effective in a clinical setting when it comes to other humans. Mm -hmm. And so there's this kind of race to, to, to be the first to publish. And in fact, the first article that is published is a letter to the editor. And uh, it's, Ma it's Maurice Rabin, and he has a letter to the editor, and it's, um, it's published, and it's published in, in 1958 because there had been a series of conferences that had, took in, that had taken place that year, and other people, including Lee, who uh, isolated it, are reporting on the successes that they're having in the clinical setting. And so um, there's definitely, and, and then, and he's the only person that gets the credit for it. Um, so did I answer your question? I yeah, think so, yeah. yeah no, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> so that kind of traces the history of it. So, um, so what's happening concurrently of that? In part, you start to see kind of uh, the, the refinement of the use of growth charts in the pediatric setting, mm -hmm. so in the clinics. So in the late 19th century, when you start to see averages presented in pediatric textbooks, they're mostly tables. And they're, um, they're, they're very transparent about where all their data is coming from. And they're kind of questioning some of the data. They question whether they should parse out things racially. Um, genders never really kind of question, which is like a really interesting, I wonder why. But, um, but by the 1920s, those charts start to look much more like diagnostic tools than like uh, discursive sites for all this discussion about what do we do with these averages. So is the chart the connection between the story of short stature becoming a kind of cause of progressive reformers and at the same time the the, the clinical or pharmaceutical development of, of human growth hormone? Because right now I, I imagine that progressives weren't thinking we need a drug to cure short stature. That was not, that was not their cause at right. all. They wanted social reform. And the pharmaceutical industry, they weren't thinking, oh, here's the answer. In the place of social reform, we'll just make kids taller. Like these two groups were not talking to each other. No. So is the, is the human growth chart the, the key that kind of enables these histories to intersect? In part, because the interest of collecting all that data does kind of come from that uh, background of like wanting all that scientific information to know how healthy we are as a nation, right? This whole idea of population health at a national level. And children seem to be very key in gauging what is national health and where are we and where do we need to go because they're the future generations. So, um, so yes, in large part, and then the pedia, and what happens with those charts is as you see the discussions kind of go away, and there's only a chart, what becomes, and what was highly debated before the 1920s was, what should growth charts look like, right? And what should the data be? Should it be representative of growth, of actual growth, because we call them growth charts, but in this case, it's really a series of averages that are, that are plotted on a line, and that line is quite synthetic, right? So they're averages of how tall you should be when you're five and how tall, right? So, um, so as that becomes more of a synthetic representation, um, short stature has definitely seen something as below the normal. Mm -hmm. And progressives have a role in part of like what gets picked as averages because there's this interest in can we uplift people if we make our averages 
actually averages of optimal. So middle class, white, like we want everyone to like experience that level of health. Mm. And that's a persistent um, trend in the development and the use of growth charts, even up until the 1970s. So in 1976, the growth charts that were used and I'm skipping a lot, and there's a lot to that history. But in 1976, the growth that are the growth charts that are being used in the U.S. actually become um, what the World Health Organization uses. And in the birth, in the in the youngest charts, so the charts that represent zero to two, the data that's used to create these averages comes from a white middle class town, a white middle class uh, community in Dayton, Ohio. 876 kids. How was that community right. chosen? <laughs> it has a long, a, a large history of uh, being, or a long history of being um, a, a site where there is this long term growth study that was taking place. Uh, so they took the data from there because it was pre existing and they needed something for those early charts. That becomes this, the, that becomes not the ideal, but the normal for everyone around the world with this idea that it will help uplift children out of poverty. Huh. But those growth charts are also used in clinical settings. And wow. as the World Health Organization kind of endorses it, it becomes something that is applied in many different spaces besides Dayton, Ohio. Right, it all goes back to Dayton, Ohio. Yeah. It's kind of crazy, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so taking us back a little bit to the photos of Lewis Hine, I know that you're, the beginning of chapter two opens with a photo, uh, or a couple of photos of his, and that chapter ends with an image that you showed a few moments ago of a baby who was on the, the cover of a Children's Bureau brochure, flanked by its parents, his parents maybe. Um, and that brochure was from the 1930s, Lewis Hine's photos are from the 1910s. As you keep referring to race, and it's notable that the children in these images are all white. What is it that's happening to our cultural understanding of short stature inside that period? Why is that a critical period that tends to the, to the end of the 30s? Well, it's really the time where in which it becomes uh, one of the, well, uh, so I'm going to answer your question in a, in a few different arenas. Sure. As pediatrics becomes more professional, mm -hmm. as you see infant mortality decrease, they are coming up with standards. And one of the standards for the clinical experience for, um, for a well baby appointment would be the measurement of a mm -hmm. child. And so in part, it's the ritual of measuring height and weight. Um, and so, and those are, there are large campaigns that take place starting in 1918 and then in subsequent years that really kind of promote this practice so you can find out how healthy your baby is, right? So there's that, in, that, that development that's taking place that becomes something that um, parents are learning about and learning about what they're supposed to do is take their child to these well baby clinics. And then also pediatricians are using it as standards. And so, and then there's these large national campaigns. So they're linking it to national health. Right, and what's interesting is that in the um, big campaign that takes place in the 19 teens, the the measurement and the data that they receive, they make these uh, these growth charts, and then they send them out as these are the growth charts that we're recommending that you should use, and they only have data from white children, mm -hmm. and and white in like the strict sense. So like. Scandinavian, Italian isn't in there as well. And the justification is we didn't get that data back, so we can't make a chart based mm -hmm. on it, which is, you know, we can debate that. And I guess you'd have to sift through. That's one place I didn't end up is sifting through all the data of what they did and didn't get. Yeah. Um, they do address it, though. And it sets up the stage for kind of like optimal health being a, a, from a certain population. Mm -hmm. And so that's a development that's taking place. And growth hormone, the discovery of it, the application of it in a clinical setting, doesn't really touch upon, doesn't, doesn't hit there yet. Like it's not, they're not intersecting at all. Um, that's gonna come later. And in part, it comes in the 1930s when there's increased, um, or there's the reporting of quote unquote success with some of the pharmaceuticals that are out there at that time. Um, in particular, there's a pediatrician who is uh, in Detroit and he, he reports on success and reports it to Park Davis and he's like, your, your drug is working, which was called Anterotwin G. Um, he's like, it's working, like this is great. He unexpectedly passes, and so they kind of lose like one of their major advocates, and so and then the subsequent reports are like, this isn't working like we thought. Um, point being here is that you start to see like those successes, they think, oh, there's a chance. And some of those successes are actually reported on in, uh, in newspapers. So again, the public is learning about success of growth hormone therapy, which it's not successful, but they're, they're, they think it is. 
And the fact that they think it is, I think, is of importance and significance because it hones in on what population is going to kind of be that object for therapy because who it works with are ones that can still grow because right. it's not working, right? Right. So right. it's kind of like a logic that you have to unpack. So it's coinciding with their growth spurts and being read as successful. Or of other properties that are in the drugs, mm, right? And they still right. have, but it's still a certain population because they're able to be affected by that. Right, right. So at what point it, does this become a story of, of the height of boys? Is it always from the beginning? I mean, you mentioned that gender is, at least in the beginning, kind of not playing a major role, but this, this seems to be, it's a focus on boys in Lewis Hines photos, later right. photos. Right. And yeah, so. So, um, so some of those studies, uh, well, the studies in 1958, mm -hmm. that there's three studies that come out, but one that gets published. The one that gets published is on a boy. Um, and then the two other, I think one is a girl, one is a boy. So there's three case studies that are kind of, so there doesn't seem to be gender specificity there, or maybe there's a preference to one gender over the other. But the interest or the increasing um, connection between short boys and growth hormone really takes place from the time period where they realize that growth hormone, the, the, the growth hormone that they're using, the preparations they're using, are not therapeutically effective, which becomes clear in 1944. And so what happens is they say, well, what are we, what are we gonna do? How do we treat people who are coming in? And you have the emergence of a new, uh, another specialty, pediatric endocrinology at this time, and in 49, happens to be in San Francisco again, there is, um, there's a conference uh, the American Pediatric Association has a conference and they have a round table with some of the leading pediatric endocrinologists and they report on uh, what, do they do, what are they doing with the therapy now, like where are they now? And the response, and one of them being um, a researcher here, um, says we're using testosterone instead mm -hmm. of using growth hormone. And testosterone, and um, I'm, if there's clinicians or pediatricians in the aud audience, I'm sure can speak uh, better about this than I can, but testosterone will give you a growth spurt, but it will cut off your final, it uh, ends up to be the case that it more normally will cut off what your potential height could be. So it does create spurt, that growth spurt, right? And, but it has some side effects. And is it being administered to both boys and yes, girls? Yes, and it has side effects. And they say, well, the girls aren't like it, it's just the boys. But with the boys, it's actually helping them even more so um, than maybe just growth hormone um, because uh, they're, th th some of the side effects is actually to, uh, is, is a benefit to them because they're being bullied in school because they're small. Mm. And so this is what's talked about at the round table oh, is wow. that um, testosterone's okay. And, it, and if the girls have the side effects, they have the side effects. Huh. Um, it's also during the 1950s, you start to see the, the increase in um, the use of estrogen to cut off the growth of tall girls. So, oh, wow. yeah, there's some cultural forces that are going on there, yeah. heteronormative uh, biases that are in play, um, where those two therapies start to kind of coincide with mm. one another, so they're parallel with one another. And in fact, the um, Raven's uh, uh, case study that gets published as the letter to the editor, the, the, um, his patient was treated with both growth hormone and testosterone for a while. Oh, really? Yeah, but that's kind of you know, put in the background when people talk about that being, that hailed as the case that, yeah. that really put growth hormone on a different trajectory. Mm. And are pediatricians discussing bullying in the context of? Yeah, they actually said, well, you know, he can pull up his pants and now he is, have like a belt, so like he can actually, uh, his butt belt fits him. That's part of the discourse that takes place huh. in this round table. So it's a good thing. Yeah. And they're like, and they, and they're like, we have mothers bringing their children, boys in saying they're being bullied and they don't know what to do and they're, and they're small stature and they're looking for us for help. Wow. So yeah, there's some discussions about it. And, um, and there's, there is a public interest in what's happening with growth hormone therapy and how it can treat short stature. Even Lee, who's really, he, this, he spends so much of his career kind of working on growth hormone and trying to get it um, not only to be ther therapeutically applicable, but also uh, to synthesize it. He receives a letter from a Chinese American woman who says, you know, I hate being short, and I hear you're working on growth hormone, is there anything you can do for me? So you do hear, um, you do see some documentation in the archives mm -hmm. of people reaching out to medicine to help them with what they find is an increasing problem, uh, what, what seems to be an increasing problem as the de decades go on. Those same type of letters and that same type of discourse isn't there in the 30s when they're doing the same type of clinical testing, um, but you start to see it much more in the 50s. Oh, really? Wow. How is the public hearing about this at this point in time? It's reported on in the newspaper. I mean, in large part, you, see, you know, as, as a discovery is made, mm -hmm. it makes its way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very true. So 
Rewinding just a little bit back to the Lollipop Guild, part of what you talk about is, is, is related to how the line between dwarves and midgets is drawn and what this line between the two signifies in the history of human growth hormone. I mean, it's, it's relevant to this history. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Sure. Um, so in this time in the 19th, so in this time being uh, primarily we're looking at the ninth, well, turn of the century. Actually, you could go back to the 19th century mm. with Tom Thumb, General Tom Thumb. Uh, so uh, Charles Stradwood. And he is selected by P.T. Barnum to be part of his, uh, his well, later on his circus, but also his display that's, uh, that's in New York. And the way in which he's advertised is that he's advertised as an entertainer, and he's advertised as a perfect specimen, a miniature specimen of a man. And this idea, and at this time, those that entertain as quote-unquote midgets and those that are perceived as such, um, there's this really like firm... Uh, distinction that's often made where uh, and you know how true this anyways there's a clear distinction that's being made so the self-identification that these are not dwarfs these are not folks that are disproportionate but they are miniature people and this idea even that they might even be from a different time period so like they they've come from the they've fallen off the books of fairy uh, uh they've fallen off the pages of fairy books fairy tale mm -hmm. books is sometimes how they're advertised or they're reported on and there's a vaudeville circuit that features entertainers the entertainers kind of play off on that they also play off on masculinity so they do boxing matches and what have you but the real focus is that these are these are people who are just miniature they're just like us but they're just miniature and so there's this real interest and fascination in fact it's, it's been, um, well, at the time it was touted as one of the most popular public events during the Civil War, beyond the war, that's a pretty important, significant event, would be the marriage of quote unquote General Tom Thumb and his wife, who was also um, a performer, but they, they were married for, for a few decades as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, and it's a large gathering, and people come out to New York to see it, and um, it's a it's a big affair. They go and they tour the they tour the world. They meet the Queen. I think it's the Queen at the time, and so it, it's a it's a pretty big deal. It's reported on heavily in the newspapers, in the journals, and so you do see this kind of real interest in um, in these kind of miniature people. Um, that is going to change in the late nineteenth. It's starting in the late nineteenth century with the advent of scientific medicine. Um, folks that are seen as, as quote unquote midgets are starting to be kind of questioned about their health status. Mm -hmm. Is this really, is their short stature really an indication that something is wrong with them? And then, on t and so they're seen as abnormalities, right? And so that will progress where you start to see these, um, some of these stories of growth hormone therapy being successful. At the same time, you see these entertainers that were quite successful in the entertainment world being questioned, why aren't you getting treated? Right? They now have a cure for what you are. Why wouldn't you want to be taller? And so, um, so their two worlds do intersect. And they're also um, categorized as being pathological. And that also that they're trying to hoodwink the population. And so as that, because you know, they could really be taller if they only took the effort. So you go from this kind of uh, space of wonder to a space of contempt. And uh, entertainers try to persevere and navigate those waters. And often what happens is that they play more childlike roles like we see in The Wizard of Oz. Oh. So, the, so A, they're seen as a different race. So the munchkin race. And then they're seen as, as, as more caricatures than necessarily as miniature men. So mm -hmm. it's this transformation that takes place as they find themselves kind of being, um, uh, people write articles in popular journals about how that these are really diseased people. Why would you want to go and see diseased people? Um, uh, physicians uh, who are teaching in medical schools sometimes bring in people from quote unquote freak shows and have them. In fact, the circus for the uh, PT Barnum actually doesn't have um, quote unquote freak entertainment for about five years or so um, because they say this is something that's antiquated. We now know that this is your medical problems. Wow. So there's this transformation that takes place and they kind of lose their positioning. Um, that, I mean, they were still discriminated against, but it was a different way of the discrimination, and mm -hmm. the medicalization takes this certain tra trajectory with scientific medicine. That's interesting. It's related to how you talk about the fact that there are times in our history when short stature has been pathologized, and then times when it's been 
conceived of or talked about as a disability, that sometimes it's a disease, sometimes it's a disability at different moments in time. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that, that shift, how short stature is sometimes conceptualized one way and sometimes conceptualized another way. Well, most recently, it's been, um, there's been an attempt to try to frame it as a disability. And in mm -hmm. fact, there was a USA article in the um, late 2000s um, that had that very title, a short stature disability. And um, it, the story starts off with a small boy who's in, it, it, it actually goes back in his life and it talks about how he's about to start school and his parents were so concerned because they thought, you know, they went into the school and they wanted to make sure um, the amenities would be able to be reachable by him because he was so small statured and they wanted to get him on growth hormones so that it could promote his growth. He didn't have a growth hormone deficiency. So from the 1960s up until 19, um, the 1980s, you had to have, you had to be able to establish that you had a deficiency in growth hormone in order to be treated with growth hormone. That changes uh, slowly and it changes in an uneven way, right? So there's the development of a category known as idiopathic short stature, which is that you're, you're short, and we don't know quite why you're short, but you're still short. And even though, okay, so this is a new category, and there's, a, there's an effort to get treatment uh, for folks that are in that space. And one of their arguments, which is completely accurate, is that even if you were getting treated with growth hormone because you're growth hormone deficient, what they were treating was not necessarily the deficiency, but your short stature to the point where in which if you reached a certain height, and for boys it was five feet, for girls it was four, eight, I believe, um, your, your, your treatment would end. And that was a way in which they could tell like how long you would be on growth hormone and how long you wouldn't, or if your growth pattern had ended. But for any, so the argument when folks with uh, children that were diagnosed with ISS, um, their argument was that, well, you've always treated for short stature, even for other um, syndromes and diseases that exist that slowly got FDA approval for the treatment of growth hormone therapy, they were always treating for the short stature. So Noonan syndrome, for example, which has, um, I can't speak deeply about Noonan syndrome, but one of its effects is that it can promote short stature. And so they were able to get growth hormone uh, uh, therapy um, to get it approved for Noonan syndrome so it could promote the growth. It doesn't, doesn't fix that syndrome, it just promotes uh, their growth. It just reverses that symptom that they're experiencing. And so what you see now is that there's this discussion about is short stature a disability or not? Well, the minute that you say disability, the state becomes involved, right? Not just the FDA, but also the state. If you are declaring something a disability, you can get disability insurance and you can get funding for it. So mm -hmm. there's that complication on top of it. Also, um, growth hormone therapy is actually really expensive. And so uh, if you're trying to get it where it's FDA approved, there's FDA approval and then also what insurance will cover and what they won't. And so there's been a, actually a pushback by the insurance companies not to treat ISS. So as far as understanding as a disability, that type of specific language, that's something that's definitely coming more recent. I but see. to see it as a disadvantage or a psychosocial risk factor, that actually, in, in children, right? And in particular boys, that actually goes back to about the 1960s or so. Um, but now that disability discourse, and it's just, it's way more complicated than, uh, well, I hate to say complicated, but it has a lot of different layers to it. Um, so it has insurance companies, it has FDA approval, um, and then even when FDA approves for, for uh, some of the growth hormone to be uh, applied to um, ISS, because every growth hormone company kind of going for that approval, they often get stipulations of what they can do and what they can't do. So it's a big negotiating field. And um, there's literature that comes out in the 70s or so, and you find out some of this literature is backed by pharmaceutical companies that talk about how you know, it's detrimental to be short, um, even if you have growth hormone deficiency or not. Um, it's detrimental as a child to be short. Mm -hmm. um, uh, presidents, there's a real classic, and every year that, that we have a presidential election, um, you can tell who's gonna win based on who's the tallest, right? This is an article that they just, they, they repurpose every four years. Um, so this idea that being short somehow limits your potential is, is ingrained within our society by mm -hmm. this point. Yeah. And so it's disabling, and disabling in particular for men. What's really interesting is that there's some research that's coming out right now in Australia that um, is questioning about what does short stature mean um, in a sexual minority uh, community, so gay mm. men in particular, and how do gay men perceive short stature, and mm. do they see it as something that's, that's limiting their quality of life? 
um, and some interesting results. That's, a, that's not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily uh, map onto that community the way in which we see some of the heteronormative uh, stereotypes playing out. Interesting. Yeah. So it seems that at this point in the conversation, we're missing a critical piece because we've heard a lot about the early um, versions of human growth hormone that didn't work, the use of testosterone, which, which worked, but, but for possibly different reasons. But at some point, there is a clinically effective human growth hormone developed. And where, where is that moment? And, and what's the key to that, that piece of the story? 1958. 50. So in 1956, they realized it's species specific. 1958 is the first reported case on effective clinical growth hormone uh, therapy in, in, his, in an adolescent. And so from there you have, um, but it's cadaver based. So the problem is, and traditionally in the literature, the problem is, well, there's only a limited amount. So um, this isn't really when an industry takes hold. But what's interesting about it is that, or what I argue, is that it's not necessarily a limited amount. If you think about it, it's an infinite amount. And so, <laughs> because there's cadavers, I mean, that, that's, a, that's something that, that's a population that grows, that continuously grows, mm -hmm. and that you can excavate, and you can end up with the pituitaries, and you can create growth hormones. So it's not necessarily that there is a, um, a finite amount, but it's how do you get access to that limitless repository. Mm. And so um, what happens is there, there's a few strategies. Some researchers and some clinicians like Lee, who's at UCSF by the, at this time, he's still there. He spends his whole career here. Um, he uh, actually creates his own private bank and pulls uh, and, and gets cadavers from throughout the world and, use, and has his own, and also from local hospitals here. So um, he has his own network and he's able to harvest pitu uh, pituitaries and harvest a particular growth hormone. Mm. And then you have, uh, the, on a federal level, you have the development of what's known as the National Pituitary Agency. And this agency is uh, created by some of the, um, the leading folks in, in research at this time in growth hormone. And they're interested in the clinical applications of this hormone, uh, in particular, obviously, on children. And so um, they create a federal, federal agency that has its own, uh, it, it produces and also distributes growth hormone in the United States, in Canada, and to some extent, Australia. There's some kind of cross uh, importing and exporting that's taking place there. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so with that being said, this organization exists from the early 1960s all the way up into 1985, and it is, your growth hormone is free, right, if you're a researcher that wants it or clinician, but you have to frame your use of growth hormone as it being as a research endeavor. And so, and you have to get approval by the National Pituitary Agency in the United States. So um, that's kind of the caveat, and then it has these limitations like five foot and four feet, four feet eight. Um, some interesting things happen in the pituitary agency, some poor refining skills that actually leads uh, to, to uh, the outbreaks of um, CJ, CJD in the 1980s, which actually stops the National Pituitary Agency in, uh, in 1985 from distributing any more cadaver-based human growth hormone. And what happens is Genentech had been poised to uh, provide their version uh, to clinicians and to parents and children and they quickly get FDA approval where up until that point they were really stymied in the process and they were having a hard time getting that approval. That happens pretty quickly once there's kind of at that point there is a lack of resources mm. um, and so they become the obvious kind of choice. Um, although that market actually starts, that the, the free market or yeah, the, right, the free market, so free meaning that there's a competitive market that's there in the US, actually starts a few years before that. The FDA approves two European companies um, to sell their growth hormone in the United States. And before the outbreak happens, there's actually one pharmaceutical company, Serrano, um, is trying to poise itself as the natural growth hormone source. Mm -hmm. And so they're saying, well, it's natural. You don't want to take that genetic synthetic stuff because they know that that's looming and eventually they'll get the FDA approval. Uh -huh. so, um, so the point being there is that growth hormone therapy is very much regulated by the federal government. It's free and um, you, there's like certain spaces where it's allowed and not allowed throughout that time period. Mm -hmm. now you've talked a lot about Genentech. When exactly do they become a part of this story and, and, and what is their role in this history? Well, I don't think they built this building or funded this <laughs> building, but they play a pretty big role, right? So there's this competition to, um, 
and, and I don't necessarily go deeply into this story, but there's a, there's a competition between researchers here and also researchers that are here uh, that take some of uh, some information and create Genentech. And uh, they want to uh, synthesize, uh, they want to have a recombinant version, DNA version of growth hormone. And, and they're both racing. And the UCSF lab is actually funded by Eli Lilly. Genentech is actually being funded by Cabby Pharmaceuticals, which is the other European company that does have access to our market. And so they go through this really kind of interesting negotiation of who's going to have access to the market and who doesn't. Genentech needs them just for resources. They don't have necessarily a ton of resources. And so they, but early on um, in the late 1970s and the early 1980s, it becomes clear that this is, this is coming, this is happening. We are going to get this drug. Um, it is going to end up, you know, uh, really changing the way in which uh, growth hormone therapy is uh, applied and just, um, you know, there's some talk about how it will make growth hormone more plentiful, but that's usually happening by the advertising by growth hormone. So they have these like, uh, they have these advertisements in the Journal of um, a Pediatrics that says soon, very soon, right? Like just wait. Um, meanwhile, the, like, the, the amount of growth hormone that's available actually increases starting in 1980 to the point where in which Robert Blizzard, who is um, one of the uh, chief organizers of the NPA, actually experiments on growth hormone uh, on himself for, for a while and four other people who I haven't yet like identified who these four other scientists are, but they want to see what are the anti-aging properties of growth hormone. Oh. He stops his self experiment and this is cadaver-based human growth hormone, which ends up being kind of the deadly, ver not kind of, it is the deadly version. Um, not that bad, but earlier on, there's a longer story there. But anyway, so he's actually self-experimenting on, on him, and, and he stops the experiments in part because he says that it doesn't turn his gray hair black. <laughs> that was kind of like an offline interview um, that I didn't have, but Randy Epstein did conduct. And so, uh, so there's kind of this fascination with growth hormone as it starts to become more plenit plentiful in the cadaver sense, and then also this, this you know, this is coming, this Genentech product mm. is coming. This raises so many interesting questions, but does it, what does its life as an anti-aging um, agent look like? So I don't, I don't discuss it in the book, but there's an upcoming article that um, I'm actually working on with uh, Liz Watkins, who is the dean of the graduate division. And what it looks like is that by the time, there's a series of studies that take place in the late 1980s that suggest that growth hormone might have a therapeutic anti-aging impact. This builds upon previous research and studies and self-help books that said taking growth hormone promoters actually can promote anti-aging. So there's actually a long discourse about how you can kick up your own growth hormone production in order to um, co uh, combat some of the, uh, the side effects or the direct effects of aging. And, um, and so these studies take place in the late 1980s. Some people believe, and in part it has to do with Genentech uh, uh, being quoted in one of the articles, as we're kind of looking for other places where we can use this or where this can be applied to, because mm -hmm. growth hormone deficient children is a pretty small population, and so they're working on getting that population larger, but they're also working on trying to find other, other places or other syndromes, i.e. aging becomes one of them. Um, so Daniel Redman, who actually had done work on, uh, with children, and growth hormone in the late 1970s, then shifts his, his focus to a VA in Milwaukee and older men. And those kind of two interests of growth hormone and his new population kind of come together. Mm. And so the study becomes uh, widely reported on, even though the study itself is like, you know, let's be cautious. These are just, you know, we just noticed that there was some effect. There seemed to be more muscle growth in particular is what they kind of reported on. And then, um, it, Subsequent studies say that it's quite. There's some serious side effects that might promote cancer. In fact, the FDA um, funds nine studies, and they halt the studies because of some of the other data that's coming out that this says this could be quite dangerous. But by that time, there is an anti-aging uh, medicine uh, kind of group that builds off of the um, Life Extension Foundation which now has a church and gets funding from Elon Musk. That's a different story. So, anyway, so that started in the early 1980s um, that promoted life extension. And, and they kind of train, they, they have their tentacles in many different places, including cryonics. 
Um, but in the late 1980s, uh, what happens is some of the folks that kind of learn the tactics from these self-help groups that we see in the early 1980s start A4M. And A4M is um, anti-aging medicine, and they have their own classes. Um, they give your own certificates now. They have their own very large conventions. So it's an organization that's still alive and kicking now. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea that you can extend your life to 120 years and then also combat aging at the same time. Wow. So yes, they have, offer a lot, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I have many more questions, but I'm just going to ask one final one, and then we can open it up for questions from the audience. And my final one is, where are we today? in this story? I mean, is, is short stature as stigmatized as ever, in your opinion? Are we, are we using or conceptualizing human growth hormone in ways that we hadn't historically? Or are there other pieces of the story that are you know, taking interesting turns and taking us in new directions? I'm so much more comfortable in the past. So it's a difficult <laughs> question for me to answer. Um, you know, I have a lot of questions about that as well. Mm -hmm. um, in part, uh, growth charts and the use of growth, you know, not even just growth hormone, but where is uh, kind of the diagnostic tool of the growth chart. As uh, I gave in this very room the pediatric grand rounds uh, two years ago, and my first slide was of two growth charts, and one was pink and one was blue, and I asked the audience what, one's, what one is for girls and what one's for boys. The pinks for girls and the blues for boys, right? It's a you know great a great opener, I guess. But my point being is that you know it's gendered how we see height mm -hmm. and how we see growth. Where do trans children fit into that? You know, and and I don't know. I'm not an active. I'm not a pediatrician. So these are questions. Kind of I have a, what the usefulness of those diagnostic tools are. Also, what is the usefulness of averages, synthetic averages over uh, averages over actual growth, which has been an ongoing discussion in pediatrics and then in particular in, in the human growth field, mm -hmm. I guess you could call it. So there's some of those questions that I have. Um, what's interesting in the 1990s, there's, uh, there's some scholarship that comes out that says, wow, you know, all of these things that we thought short stature was kind of doing to our children isn't really doing it. Um, so they're not that upset about being short. Um, so some mixed kind of uh, mixed data there. But can is, they be president? But can they question. be president, right? And then I think there was previous, like, wasn't Obama shorter than Romney? Yeah, so I think so. So like that, you know. Case closed, I guess. I right. <laughs> but this idea of you know um, maybe short stature isn't necessarily what we thought it is. Um, I also think that uh, just more variation of stature in public spaces. You see that just diversity overall. Mm -hmm. um, so it's interesting. Uh, the most recent. Uh, kind of article search that I did had the, the, what I'm thinking about and the questions that I'm having are different than what people in the field are having, which I'm not that surprised. But um, in the field, there's a discussion about the gender bias and how global it's come. Mm -hmm. It's become so um, there's a gender bias in Japan. Uh, why? And, and, and can we reverse it? And can we promote more use of the growth hormone? And that is and by a study. gender bias, you mean like bias against tall girls? Or no, bias no? against, we're not, we're not giving enough girls a, like the, oh, the growth hormone therapy. Like we need to give it to everyone who's short, not mm. just boys. And so, yes, that was somebody that was funded by a pharmaceutical company, but mm. then also was doing her own research and creating databases. And there's large databases that are being collected by pharmaceutical companies that, um, that uh, try to document growth on growth hormone. There's this understanding that, in fact, if you don't, like, there's this prevailing kind of assumption with some data to it. If you actually don't have growth hormone deficiency, growth hormone therapy is not as effective as if you have ISS. Mm -hmm. So there's, so there's a more, I think there's more conflicting stories that are out there than they were before. Um, but where I see it going, uh, I think if you look in the past of where it's going is that it probably will change and evolve and kind of re reflect some of the cultural values that we have about short stature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as history always does show us. Yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> that. So any questions from the audience? How much money did the growth, the, the big pharma make off of growth hormone? That would be great yeah. to start. Yeah. So, um, in the 50s and then now. Yeah. So, in the, so, so, when, so, the, so during the time of the National Pituitary Agency, we don't see huge, they're not making money because the growth hormone is free, right? So um, as far as in the 20s, 30s, and 50s, the, they're, they're, not, they're, they're just trying to figure out. They're not necessarily tracing a lot of profit to it. So Park Davis in particular is a company that I took a look at in the book and also in my research. And much more is it about, um, like, we can't get this out of the laboratory. So there's that concern. But there are other companies, um, 
Armor in particular, they do have the product, and I don't know necessarily them to num know the numbers, but they are making a point to advertise it. So there's something that's there that they're that they're getting, but it wasn't necessarily um, a drug that that company was founded on. It just it was one among many. Um, as far as in the 1960s, what's interesting is even though the National Pituitary Agency does have this kind of hold on our market where it's much more federally regulated, um, when it gets started, they actually have a representative from Merck to kind of explain like how they should set up their structure. So there's a there's there's definitely a connection there, um, but they're not necessarily giving Merck money, and Merck is not necessarily one of the major drug companies that uh, positions themselves in the growth hormone industry. In Europe, profits are larger because, and this is like one of the only times in history, Europe actually doesn't regulate it on a governmental level. They allow for the free enterprise to take hold. And that leads to also harmful, uh, harmful growth hormone being uh, distributed and, and killing children. So, um, or when they get older and they're adults. So there's, there's that development. And I'm not as clear with those numbers, but CABI was a, was a Swiss owned, so it's a government owned pharmaceutical company, but that it also has private profits as well. And they help fund the, the, the beginning of Genentech. And Genentech, while it does well with growth hormone, and in fact, um, they're able to get an orphan drug status because there is such a small population that they're catering to. And that status, they thought, wow, it's really going to poise us for a long time. But the year after they get that status, so 1986 or 87, Eli Lilly is able to come onto the growth hormone market. And they do really well in this market. Um, if you are, if you become an employee of Genentech Tech and you take their tour, their orient, during orientation, they're not going to mention growth hormone as like being their founding hormone, but it is. Um, and I've heard this, like, they're, yeah, they kind of they jump up to like all the things that they've done. Why don't they? They're interested it? in like telling you about curing cancer because mm -hmm. it's not necessarily the drug that makes them look mm -hmm. like they're alleviating the suffer, suffering of others, right? right? It is a very controversial right. drug. Yeah. I mean, that's my guess. I'm not in the heads. If I was in the heads of the Genentech. Uh, head guys that right. be in a different place. But um, my point being is that there is profit to be made. Um, the hard numbers I don't have off the top of my head, but there's, an, like I said, there's an interest to expand their market. They try to do that as much as they can and also to expand it to ISS. That becomes a real um, focus starting in the mid-1990s. All of the stuff about anti-aging, they don't get any money off of it. But A4M does quite well, <laughs> right? And so, and they're able to um, push an extended definition of growth hormone deficiency. So growth hormone deficiency becomes kind of uh, back in vogue because their argument is that um, all aging people actually have growth hormone deficiency. If you if you compare growth hormone levels to somebody who is elderly or, or uh, yeah, not age, even elderly. Age. I would even say like in your 30s or 40s. <laughs> okay. So that's way not elderly. But if you if you base it off somebody in their 20s, in their mm -hmm. early 20s or teens, like it's a totally it's there's a disparate mm -hmm. uh, amount. And so the argument is that all all people who are not in their teens and 20s are growth hormone deficient. Therefore, we should be able through the FDA give them growth hormone mm -hmm. treatment. So they do quite well. I don't have firm numbers on that. Um, it's a billion dollar industry. You know, just one billion. No, billions. Yeah, I think I have in my epilogue, I think I actually have hard numbers of what it is, but it's no, I like. Would, I, would, I would like those. Yeah. It's not that big. You know, I mean. Growth hormone itself? No. A, oh. a billion dollar industry. No, right. it's not. Right. Yeah. Not right. for I think I call it a billion dollar industry, but I mean, there's, there's profits to be made, definitely. Mm -hmm. And the numbers are in my epilogue of the exact, but those are some of the companies that do profit off of um, the development of this therapy. So the two questions are, first, where is genetics yes. in this history? And second, were the kids who were first given human growth hormone as a treatment first tested for deficiencies in vitamins or other sorts of deficiencies? Two great questions, and I'm, I'm glad you presented the puzzle. So um, the interest in genetics and short stature really it comes from the research that I conducted. It comes from eugenics, and uh, in particular, Harry Laughlin who's this really interesting um, leader in the American eugenics movement. Interesting because he is um, someone who never has children himself because he identifies as being somebody who is not of perfect stature. Um, he, has a, he has a quote unquote deformity and, uh, and, and is just super curious about you know, what is being inherited. He's also one of the main um, authors of the uh, model sterilization law that um, is developed by uh, eugenicists um, after the uh, the victory um, in Buck versus Belt. 
So anyways, which is in 1927. So Harry Laughlin is really intrigued by this idea of is it, a, it, can you inherit short stature? It looks like you can, right? And is it a single, is it a single trait or not? And so um, he actually has this big study that takes place where they, do, they conduct these surveys, they ask people to do kind of family trees. Um, David Storr Jordan, who's at Stanford, he fills out one. Um, so all this kind of information, can, can we really kind of map it out? And at the same time, there's just an interesting, um, venture about you know what are averages in the United States. So there's a laboratory at Harvard that's trying to collect as much data as possible. And these two worlds collide, or these two interests collide, actually at the Chicago World's Fair in the 1920s because, no, 1930s, excuse me, because it's during the Depression. And they're interested in, um, in, in measurement. And so they actually have an exhibit in the, in the fair in like the fun fun part of the fair, I don't know. I guess this is fun at the time. I'm not sure where they're measuring attendees of the of the fair itself. Now, alongside that, there's also what's known as uh, the midget village, and so you can go into this space and you can see this, and it's got this. Uh, uh, these borders that are Bavarian because they're saying you're going back into time into this kind of ancient fairy tale space and you're going to see um, midgets in, in their, their true habitat, I guess is kind of the, you know, and you can actually see them like in court, there's a mayor, um, there's actually some, in, in some of the souvenir material, they're like, you know, you can see what they do at play and at rest and they kind of insinuate like really strange stuff. But anyways, so um, so the scientists that are there, including our eugenicist Harry Laughlin, is really curious about this group, this population. So they go and they do measurements. And he takes uh, family histories. And he wants to figure out what else is going on. And he actually um, writes a letter to the uh, organizer of that village and says, thank you so much. What a great population I was, really to, uh, I was, I was wanting to tap into. So, um, so with that being said, there is an interest. It seems to be primarily from the eugenicist at that time period, um, from what I could find. And more of the interest uh, uh, for, the, for the research that's taking place, at, like here at University of California, is more about growth hormone as a hormone specifically, and a little less so about short stature. But the way in which short stature becomes a part of their story is that that's how they can say that that's there and that's effective. So that's a little bit of the genetics story. Um, I didn't really see kind of an interest about genetics before um, or in other places as much as, as robust as I saw it with Harry Laughlin in my research. The second question was, and was equally compelling. About deficiencies. So right, I, I vitamin deficiencies. Children, yeah. That seems to be a little bit more in the literature about weight. So, and that's like a, an elephant in the room, right? I haven't talked about weight very much either. Another puzzle, because height and weight are often considered together. Um, so I tried to parse out that story just in part because I was really interested in, in short stature and how it's seen as something that is a problem and later on becomes a psychosocial, fa uh, psychosocial risk factor. And so it seemed like to me, um, when there was this discussion of weight, there was much more uh, a robust discussion about vitamin deficiency. What are they deficient in? Because overall, their stature is small. When it came to height, there seemed to be less of a discussion about vitamins in particular. Um, as we start to see in the late, and that's an early on. So I'm talking about 1890s, 1900s, 19 teens. That's early. That that's. That's early for historians in the 20th century, <laughs> US historians. Um, looking more in the late 20s and early 30s, you start to see vitamins discussed early on uh, in the section that deals uh, in the pediatric textbooks that deal with stature. So there is some consideration there, like have you considered vitamins? Less about family history, but more about vitamins. So there is some, there's some mention. Um, and and that, con that continues probably in the 30s and 40s or so. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's just... Basic question: What is yeah. human growth hormone? <laughs> no, yeah. then it's a great and question. What is so it doing in the body? It is. It is promoting the growth, and it's promoting the the the, the skeletal growth, as you said. There are there is some research um, to suggest that it helps with recovery, in particular with uh, burn victims. And very early on, they're doing some studies about uh, the impact that can have in the recovery of burn and just the regrowth of skin. Um, in surgery, sometimes it's used in order to help in the facilitation of the, of the, of the reconstruction of, of skin. 
There's some research taking place that's actually funded by Mark Cuban, who is, for those that don't know, he, he's the owner of the Mavericks, um, but his foundation actually uh, is uh, funding some research at University of Michigan about um, the use of human growth hormone therapy in, um, in some uh, uh, athletic injuries. And so uh, can it help promote recovery? In the NBA and in other um, athletic arenas, there's kind of this belief that it can help you recover quicker. Um, as far as the anti-aging, but, but they're doing research right now. And part of the reason, and you know, I think it's actually, there might be a little giggle about the head of the Mavericks, but I think in some ways it's kind of admirable because you know, what else can growth hormone do? There is some question about that. Um, because it's either, I've gotten a bad rap about this whole kind of short stature story it ends up linked up with, because people are, bioethicists are very critical of that, and understandably so, some of the material that's made by pharmaceutical companies is outrageous, um, and I totally understand the critique, um, but what can it do? And, and, and doing that research of what can it do, and for so long it was linked only with short stature, um, we're kind of limited as far as what we know what it does. And there's just kind of this understanding of what it might be able to do. So in the early part of the 1980s, when you see this increased um, reservoir of cadaver-based human growth hormone, more athletes start to take it. In the Olympics in LA, it's quote unquote prolific, I guess is what they say, in part because um, there's not testing for it. Um, and, and so some people say that, it's, that it promotes sports performance. The studies haven't necessarily shown that, but there's this anecdotal um, kind of sub-story that's there. Um, there's also, uh, in the early 1980s, there's a handbook that comes out, which is called the Steroids Handbook in Bodybuilding, and um, it really touts growth hormone as something that everybody should be taking because it's gonna help your muscles get bigger. So there's this idea that it helps overall structure and the development of actual growth of muscles. Um, in the anti-aging research, they say that it just does, it's, it's a cure-all, it does everything, right? So that it uh, makes you younger, you're able to work out more, um, some people say that they can think better, um, their sleep is, is, is more sound, so there's a, and, and you can just go online and just Google it and see like all these kind of myths around it. I'm not saying that these are scientific proven facts, I'm just saying that there's a plethora of that literature, and in part, I would argue that part of the reason why that literature gets to be so robust and prominent is because we haven't necessarily looked outside of just that link between short stature and growth hormone mm -hmm. and see what maybe there are possibilities that are there. Well, it's a okay, so it's a feedback loop that takes place and that the how so it's a it's a typical hormone in that way and that it promotes growth through a feedback loop. And so the how is through a mechanical function inside the body. And so there's Human growth, so there's a human growth hormone releaser, it, 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 it travels to the uh, anterior, to, anterior pituitary gland, and then from there, it releases growth hormone. That also has a relationship with IGF, which is actually in your gut. And so there's this whole feedback loop that takes place, and from that, it sends messages out that promotes growth. So, and the understanding and the focus has been so much is the promotion of skeletal growth in particular. So the question is, what happens to this notion of child welfare and promoting the health of children at a population level? Which was something that was definitely needed at that time, right? I mean, to be a child in the United States in the early decades of the 20th century was a dangerous thing. And so if you survived it, like, kudos for you. Um, but my point being is, so your, and your question is, you know, where does that story go? And we do see, necess we do see kind of the, that story go global. And with the World Health Organization, it goes global. So it definitely goes global from an American standpoint. Um, and uh, in answering kind of with a specific example of how it goes global is that those growth charts that had become international models um, and, and are supposed to be used at an international, uh, around the world um, end up highly criticized. And in the uh, 2000s, the decision is finally made and the project finally goes underway to revamp those. And the way in which they revamp them, the big question is, you know, can we do more than 876 kids, like in white middle class, and what are we gonna do? So what they did is they were very, they, they still wanted to promote the health at a population level. They knew that these charts would be used in a clinical space to some extent, and in other spaces too, not just in the clinic, but that's one of the uh, that's one of the end spaces for these charts. So what they did is they took the measurements from middle class children throughout the world, and so they tried to make it as diverse as possible. They still wanted to have those averages to promote health overall, so they still wanted to make it kind of a middle class model, um, but it was much more of a thoughtful 
pro well, I don't mean to be highly critical of the 1970s, but the process <laughs> took into, uh, really was thoughtful in the way is that it looked at its history. And it thought, what could we learn from our history? And, it, and how can we still promote children's health and a good diagnostic tool? And that's what they came out with. And, and then also they were very transparent in their process of where the data came from and how they used the data. And they, the campaign was very robust. So I think, that's a, I think that's a good example of how you know, the history informed them of what might be best practices in moving forward. And what you have is, is data that, you know, much more representative of the world than just of a very specific space. So I think that's one way in which uh, children's public health, you probably can speak a lot about children's public health in the vaccine context. Um, that's another talk. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and then there's also the revamping of the growth, uh, growth charts in the US, um, which I would say in some cases doesn't necessarily take that same kind of exemplary model that they do in the World Health Organization. That doesn't mean that they don't necessarily uh, have a robust discussion and some of that discussion is documented. There's a discussion about whether they should parse it out via race or not. That's a, that's a discussion that happens throughout the 20th century um, and they decide not to in part because they didn't want to have a segregation of diagnostic tools. So that's a decision that's being made in the 1990s. And so uh, they try to, again, make it more reflective of the population and they take more data into, into account in order to make it more um, representative than just kind of the synthetic optimal average of a very small group of folks. Thank you all for joining us this evening and thank you, Amy. Thank you, everybody.